Hey guys, uh, welcome back to the channel. Uh, as you can see, I'm outside. It's sprinkling rain. This is probably the lightest it's going to be all day. It's supposed to rain all day. Uh, it's Saturday. Don't don't have to work, but uh, we got a bunch of blades we're going to sharpen today. I think I counted. Got 15 for a customer, and we got 13 for our sales. So we'll wipe these out this morning and uh, move on to something else. But uh, we appreciate you tuning in and uh, got a few things we'll go over our uh, BMS 250 after owning in a few months. So hang on, we'll be right back. As you can see behind me, we got our BMS 250. I don't know if you can tell it, but uh, I got the oil running. We'll get you just a little bit closer as you can see. Okay. Doing that mainly for uh, trying to warm the oil up. That's one of the first tech tips I was gonna tell you. These machines, they run a they run a excellent grade of cutting oil. It's very fine. Uh, I wouldn't say I have sensitive skin, but you know, heavy diesel type motor oils will give my hands a fit. And this, I've had no issues with. It's a, it's almost like a mineral oil. It's very very clean. Uh, but if you got it in an unheated building like I do here, when it gets down to 40 degrees, 30 degrees, or a couple weeks ago we were sharpening blades at 15, 20 degrees. You're gonna to have to heat this space to get that oil up to temperature, you know, up above 45, 50 degrees so it'll flow through your pump. Uh, got a little small propane heater sitting on the floor, plus I got the big diesel turbo heater over there in the building. So if you're gonna fly down here at seven o'clock in the morning and get started sharpening blades, um, Better come down here about an hour early and turn the, turn the heat on, get the building warmed up, give your oil time to warm up. It's not that cool this morning, it's in the 50s, but I'm letting the oil cycle anyway. Uh, heat the oil up, heat the pump up, just makes it function better. So, there's tech tip number one. Uh, we've owned this thing a few months, six months, I don't know, lose count, it goes by so fast. I know we've sharpened 300 plus blades, Lost count. I should have wrote them on the wall how I many was doing, but they go by. They go by so quick. The grinding wheels are excellent. Um, I've got a four, a seven, a seven forty-seven, and a ten. So I got I got four different wheels, and the only one we've come close to wearing out is the seven degree, <clears throat> and that's that's my fault. Uh, I had some expensive. 55 thousandths, seven degrees, that I clipped some nails with, and I cut them pretty hard, you know, four, five, six times to get them back to a usable condition. But, you know, the blade, that, uh, that wheel has sharpened the many a blade, so it's paid for itself, but just bear that in mind, if you're, if you're recutting some blades that you've hit with a nail, uh, and you really hog it off the material, well, you're you're wearing down your your grinding wheel. Uh, we got. I'm gonna have to call Joe Maine anyway. I gave him a heads up the day I needed to uh, order one, so I got to order another seven degree wheel. Uh, this this sharpener and our setter over here, the BMT 150. I bought those from Joe Maine at Industrial Cutting Tools. Now you can ask them yourselves. They are a Woodmiser dealer. Um, they don't have a contract to sell the Woodmiser LT sawmills, any of the small stuff. LTs, LXs. Uh, they're located in southern Georgia. I'd say it's probably a conflict with that big Woodmiser factory Georgia store that they have down there, but they can sell you industrial equipment. Uh, 
if you look over here in the barn it's kind of hard to see there you go if you look right in there there is a that's a new to us wheeling profamat 22 five head motor we hope to have it up running in another two or three months of a it just takes time to make something that big happen but I talked to Joe the other day and asked him if he could get knives for that and he said that would probably not be a problem that machine uh, I don't know if you ever seen a knife on a, a planer or molder normally they're flat on both sides and you lock them into your head well the wheeling runs a corrugated knife on one side it's flat and on the other side it's got like little 60 degree triangles they call it corrugated and when you lock that in there there's no way that knife is going to fly out at 10,000 rpm because they are flying so anyway uh he told me they could probably they, they handled that it was corrugated knives so that's a win-win great company to deal with if you need the blades sharpening equipment whatever uh, contact joe main he's on facebook uh i'll try to get matthew to remember to drop his phone number in the description below great company to deal with love dealing with them uh a wood advisor needs to make them a, a full dealer but anyway if you're looking at an industrial mill you know the 2000 4500s whatever uh are a complete mill system that's more what they specialize in so that being said your grinding wheels are consumable and the harder you grind them over here the shorter the lifespan is going to be uh, nobody can tell you how long they're last because it depends on how hard you grind them, <laughs> you know. And you can hear that thing when it's grinding, it's rrr, 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 or it's whoa, you know, you're just hogging the material out. And, you know, you have to make your own judgment how hard you want to run that wheel. They're about 250 bucks, time you pay the tax and shipping on them. So if you can go easy on them a little bit, get a lot more revolutions, it's probably a lot, you know, a lot more long, longevity out of them. But that being said, most of the blades that we sharpened, I know a lot of the ones we did for ourselves, they wouldn't clear in one pass, and we had to do two or three passes. We, you know, that counts as like sharpening three good blades, you know, and these, these wheels have, have sharpened a lot of blades. So I'm, I'm really impressed with the mileage that you get out of them. I don't think it's any strain to say that you should easily be able to sharpen three to 500 blades. And if all your blades, you take good care of them, and you only got to go around it one time, you know, that number could go up from there. But uh, that's just my estimate on it from what I've seen so far. Uh, the, the, uh, the sharpener, I love it. It's very simple. We only sharpen seven eight spacing. I got some customers around here that have had some of these three quarter spacing and even some half inch spacing blades. And I tell them I don't fool with them. This machine will sharpen them. But I'm not going through the hassle of losing the set I have to set up to sharpen their five half inch blades. I tell them to throw them away, buy some modern blades that are all seven eight spacing now. But if you like running those, buy your own setter, sharpen your own blades, and you won't have a problem. Uh, this machine is easy to run. Once you set it up on a seven eight spacing, you throw your blade in there and turn the uh, speed down real low so you can see it cycle up and down. And then you'll move, you'll move this bar here to get your uh, blade to move forward or back just a little bit as you need to, so that it's you know standing up there, and you want that grinding wheel to go right behind it and just lightly cut it. And then you'll take this knob and you'll raise or lower the cutter so that you're cutting in that gullet. Now, one thing I do recommend is. It's hard to see down in that gullet to make sure you're getting it. I bought a bottle of dye lube. Uh, go for the blue. Blue would be better. But this stuff, it's a machinist dye. If you get it on it, get, you, get it on your hands, you're going to wear it off. Okay, it don't come off. But you can slap that in your gullet five or six rows out. And when you come through there with your cutter head, you can see exactly that you're cutting the back of the tooth and sweep it right up the gullet with as light a pass as possible. Now you could hog it off and there's no question, but you want to take as light a pass as possible. One, to extend the life of your blade because every time you're cutting that gullet, you're, you're shortening your blade and they will, you know, at a certain point, they're going to break. 
So you want to take as light a pass as possible to sharpen it, and you want to make sure you strike the back of the, the tooth, and this helps you do that. The other, the other tool you're going to need, unless you're in a wonderful shop, and even then, you're going to need a good light. Uh, I can take this light as a blade. Let me stick this blade in here. As it's coming through there, I can take this light, stick it in behind it, and see if I'm getting a good good stroke across, across the uh, gullet of that tooth. Uh, it's a small building, it's not overly well lit, but even in a bright building, you won't be able to focus your light right there to where you can see that cut. Uh, out of all those blades we've used, we are, Okay, out of all those blades we've sharpened, we've emptied a five-gallon bucket. I've got another five-gallon bucket of oil sitting in there. Oil's pretty expensive, too. Uh, I don't remember the exact quote. $230, $40 time you taxes and shipping on it. But out of all the blades we've sharpened, we've only used five gallons of oil, and the tray is still full. And as you can see, i got a bucket here. On my little cart, and I recommend this if you're gonna get one, I got a, a cart with a high side on it. I drilled a hole right through the middle of it. So any of that oil that uh, drips off the blades, whatever hits the cart, it'll run down there in that bucket. Then we can recycle it back in the bucket. We'll move you over here just a little closer. Now here's, here's one thing I didn't think about. Uh, nobody talked about it. When you clean the bottom of this out with all your magnets, this is what you end up with. Just piles and piles of uh, iron iron filings. Got a bucket full of them down here. And here's, here's some more. What we do, we'll pull our magnets out of here. We got them all over the place. We'll sweep them off into these little uh, strainer cups, you know, painter cups. Drop it in there, let them strain out a little bit. And then I'll take and wad it up like a baseball, just literally just squeeze the oil out of it. That stuff's expensive, you know. What is that? Uh, about thirty dollars a gallon. So it, every ounce you can save by squeezing it out of the iron filings is is good habit. But I bought a pack of these on Amazon for like seven eight bucks. They're cheap. About like thirty of them. This little tip: you're gonna have to deal with the iron filings, but they all. They all end up in your, your oil bath and these, these magnets in there and I've added several, a good many magnets to catch the oil. <clears throat> because maybe if you're, if you're grinding all day, you know, when you stop for lunch, clean it out. When you stop the other day, clean it out again. And you'll have a, you'll have a handful of iron filings. Okay, I think that about covers this machine. If you're gonna run this inside a building, you definitely got to have an exhaust port. This stuff, it's... <clears throat> to some people, it's like cigarettes. They smoke, they smell horribly bad. To me, it just smells bad. It's not horrible, but you definitely don't need to be breathe this stuff. So we got an exhaust fan mounted on the outside of the building. Got a switch right there. We'll flip it on. It'll, when, when anytime we close the lid, we'll put the exhaust fan on it and out goes the smell. So, lovely machine. If you don't have one, I highly recommend it. Now, let's talk about the problem child. Using this machine, or any of them, setting blades is no small task. Uh, I can teach anybody how to sharpen a blade. In, I can have them sharpen their own blades in five, 10 minutes, no problem. You know, once you get it set up, it's real simple. Either up or down or in and out a little bit, let it go around. Uh, this thing here is a handful. And I recommend the guy doing this needs to be the guy using the saw blades. So if you get this wrong, they won't cut. <laughs> I mean, they will not cut. Is it, these blades are built with in rows of three. And when they start out, they're all three in a row. And they'll run them through their tool. They'll bend one this way, they'll bend one that way, and they'll leave the other one straight. 
and that, that's what makes your kerf. Uh, wood visor, I, they fall in a range, somewhere between 16 to 20, maybe 22 thousandths out on this one and out on the other one. So you got a combination of about, what is that, 32 to 40 degrees of kerf, plus the thickness of your blade. Your blade's 45 degrees. So you got to... Okay, let's try that again. I keep testing the camera because these GoPros don't have a, an on screen. Yeah, they'll time out after a little while. If you hit the wrong button, they do turn off. So anyway, we were talking about the kerf. If you've got 20 this way, you got 20 this way, and then you've got the blade itself, it's 45, you're up to 85 thousandths cut going through your wood. You're opening up a hole of 85 thousandths. Now, well, why ain't more, why isn't more kerf better? I'll tell you why. If you open, if you take and bend this tooth out 40 and this tooth out 40, and then your kerf is 45, you're 125 thousandths in your cut. There's nothing in the back of that, you know, you gotta realize the wood is kind of holding the back of that blade as well as your guide rollers. Now you've opened that hole up and there's nothing in there to help hold the back of the board. Any guys that sawed for a long time will know that it's easier to saw flat boards in hardwoods than it is softwoods. Well, that, when you run a cut through a softwood and you take out 80, 90 thousandths, it stays out. It don't, you know, compress back. But a hardwood, it seems like it, it tightens up a little bit as the cut goes through. And that wood that you've left in that cut will help the back of the blade from wanting to kind of wander around a little bit. So if you take and open these kerfs up to 40 thousandths or more, I've seen some more. So you've opened a hole in the back of that kerf that is so wide, you're solely dependent on these guide rollers that are, you know, if you're doing a 24 inch cut, 22 inch cut, they're way over here out of the way in the middle of that blade is kind of left to its own devices and it'll wander. So you need to keep that kerf, you know, the spread on your kerf down somewhere Anywhere from 16 to 25 is pretty acceptable um, for a wood visor blade, I think. Now, different blades may be different, totally, but I've 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 sawed with many of my own resharps, and that's kind of the sweet spot. Now, if you don't get enough kerf in there, then you don't open that hole up, and then the back of your blade, you know, behind the cutting face, is getting hot because it's dragging on the wood as it's coming through. So. There's a fine balance between both of them. Uh, the worst thing I've seen with blades is where they've set one side 28, 30 degrees, and then the other side is like 10, 12. Okay, that won't cut either because one side is way up and one side is not. So it's going through the kerf. You know, this side is trying to cut more than the, this side, and it will tend to make your blade want to climb or if it's on the bottom side, it'll make your blade want to dive. Uh, I fought it for years, guys. I'm just like you. I had a meal. I'd be sawing perfect one day, change blades, come back the next day, couldn't make it do nothing. Well, if you're not going to sharpen your own blades, I still would recommend you buy this tool because you can take a box of brand new blades. If you're having trouble sawing and you can put this tool on and you can check how many thousandths that Kerf is on one side, turn it over, and you check the kerf on the other side. So you will get a box of blades every now and then, whether they be resharps or new, that the disparity from left to right is too much. About two, to, you can push it to four degrees, but two to three degrees is kind of maximum. If this side's 20 and you're over here at 22, you know, it'll cut, it'll cut flat. But if you're 20 and you're 30, it will not cut. because It's gonna to pull to that one side. It's like a chainsaw. You get dull one side of the teeth, that saw will cut sideways. The saw, uh, wood visor bandsaw is no different. So I would recommend on one of these, whether you're going to sharpen your own or not, because I have, I have run into, unfortunately, new boxes of blades that were set wrong. Just, it happens, you know, it's a production facility. And uh, at the time I didn't have this, and buddy, let me tell you, it cost Matthew and I an eight-hour work day, and uh, 
if we had a gallon jug for a swear jar, we filled it up. It was a bad day. And it was it was all over some blades. So I'm I'm real particular on this machine. It it takes a lot of effort to to do it and do it right. Um, now I will I do my own blades, so if I get if I hit a nail or something, we'll mark it. Or if we got a, a blade that one tooth, every now and then one tooth will hit something and it'll kick it out and it'll make stripes across your wood. We call it tiger stripes. I'll mark those because we'll need to go through this center. I'll set it all the way down and I'll run it all the way around and basically try to mash those teeth back a little bit. Then we'll raise it back up and then we'll bend them, bend them all back slightly. Uh, it is, part of the aggravation is this, these blades are made out of spring steel. Okay, they have, they're, they're a different metallurgy than soft steel, they're, they're a spring steel. That being said, they don't all spring the same way because if you've run it hot, that blade's lost some of its, you know, springiness. So you bend, because when you bend it, you're technically over bending it and it springs back. But if you get a blade that's soft and you over bend it and then it don't bend back, well, now you've got it bent out too far. So it, it can be a hassle, trust me. Uh, it make you pull your gray hairs out. but. It's no different if you buy the, uh, was it the BMP 250? I read behind guys that are having issues with it. And I hate to tell them most of the time it's probably because they're resharpening a blade that got too hot and it's lost its uh, spring tension. And when you bend it out, it just stays out. Uh, that being said, try not to overrun your blades. Uh, had a guy rig my son the other day and they were just all kind of dirty and sapped up. And I'm like, dude, these wasn't worth cutting worth crap, were they? No. And we talked for a while. He's a young guy. We went over here to the sawmill, and I had all mine hung on the wall. I said, come over here and look at this. I had 12, 14 blades. I said, every one of these been run. <laughs> he looked at them. He said, man, why are they so clean? I said, that's the way they need to run. I said, that gummy stuff on there is killing your blade. It's getting heat in it. It's going to take the spring tension out of it. It's not going to cut. And that being said, I run diesel. Some of you, you know, leave comments below why you don't like it. I love it. I'm not going back to anything else. I can solve 35, 40 hours a week. We use five, six gallons at the most of diesel. And my blades look like brand new when they come off. And they look like that when I'm sawing. If you can look, you know, when I'm sawing on my mill, I'm going down through there. And I'm looking, of course, to make sure you're not going to hit nothing. Make sure I'm getting the cut that I wanted. And I'm looking at that blade, because you can see there's a gap between the side of the log, or you can't, and that first guide roller. It's usually a couple inches right there. I'm looking at that. If it's bright and shiny, perfect. If it starts looking a little gummy, you're you're getting pine rods and you're getting sap. You can get it out of oaks around here. Uh, poplars, normally not a problem at all, but uh, any of your pines, white pine, forest pine, Virginia pine, you know, name them all. They all sappy at certain times of the year but even oaks right here can be a little sappy so keep an eye on that as you're sawing keep that mess off and that'll make your blade perform longer and then uh we'll get off on tangent here this thing here it's just finicky uh the guy running it needs to be the guy sawing that way if, if it's wrong you know the, you'll learn better because i did <laughs> some of the first ones we we said i brought a couple of them back and did it again because i wasn't happy it wasn't saw right and that was all a product of, you know, one tooth being not equal to the other. So, so Matthew just drove up. He's out here. Morning, Matthew. Morning. <laughs> Matthew reads all the comments. If y'all want to send him some messages, he can. He he has my YouTube account. He has access access, access to it just as much as I do, so he can respond to all the comments. Um, we appreciate you watching. I'm going to shut up and we're going to get to work here. Uh, yeah, one little tech tip on saw blades, guys. The cleaner you can keep them while you're sawing, the better. Like I say, I run a diesel drip. If you go back and watch one of our videos uh, a few weeks back, I did a short video on how we took a LT35 and kind of made a low-tech lube miser system out of it. And that may help you guys that don't have a lube miser. But... I got a an on and off valve, and then I got an adjustment valve. And I don't normally touch it. If I'm sawing pine, I might 
just click it open a little bit. If I'm sawing hardwoods, I might click it down just a little bit. Or if I'm sawing poplar, I might even click it down just a little bit more. And every now and then, I'll turn it on just to give it a little drip to basically sweep the blade clean and keep it cool. That being said, in so, sometimes you get into pine and your drip will get just a little bit behind and I'll see it start to build up a little bit. I got an oil can, Matthew picked up the flea market sometime back. I keep it full of automatic transmission fluids. And when I'm sawing, I only do it when it's in the cut. If you do it when it's just freewheeling, it's slick enough, it'll slide the blade off your uh, blade guides. But when it's in the cut, I'll reach down there and just go one, two little squirts and it'll wipe that rosin right off the blade and then your drip can keep up. Cause every, like I say, you'll, pine logs, I saw one the other day, it had a, a sap knot about this big. Nothing but pine sap. You know, and you run through that and your drip's gonna get, get a little bit high so you can just squirt once or two, one or two times on it and it'll just wipe it right away. But that'll extend your good quality blade life. Uh, all the time people ask, how long do blades last? You know, cutting board feet. Well, it depends on you. Are you sawing dirty? Are you sawing clean wood? Are you running your debarker? Are you pushing too hard? Are you not pushing hard enough? But uh, since I resharpen my own, if I can get three to three to six hundred board feet, I'm happy because I'm more interested in cut speed and cut quality. And as soon as I lose one of those, we're going to switch the blade. I don't care if it's been on a hundred board feet or five hundred board feet. You know, I want to cut as fast as I can and get as good a cut as I can. And if I lose any of those two, we're going to switch the blade, aren't we, Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've had a few we put on and took right back off. Yep, I've had some resharps in the past. Put that thing on, take it right back off. One cut. You know, there's fifteen, sixteen dollars, eighteen dollars, whatever it was. You know, round trip, gone. Got one cut out of it. And it just didn't perform. So, okay. I'm gonna hush for a minute. We're gonna get this going. Might even drink my coffee. So we'll be right back. Okay, let's see if I can give you a little intro to what we're doing here. I got my blade in here. This is the first one of the day, uh, new customer blade. So I'm gonna drop the, the height down. I'm gonna leave the, the grinding wheels not turning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, advance the blade, kind of see where it's striking. Okay. I need to be. Matt, Matthew's going to take the camera off, try to get a little closer. As you can see, the blade is just barely striking, not quite striking the backside of the tooth, so I want to shorten the stroke up. Do a little bit of a turn there. Okay, I felt it hit, so I'm going to about half of that. Okay, depth seems probably a little light. When it comes back up, I'm gonna stop the progression with the rotary switch. I'm gonna turn the grinding wheel on. When it comes up to speed, I'm gonna slowly introduce it to the blade. There we go. I'm happy with the cut on the back side of the tube. Now, I'm gonna stop it again. I'm gonna grab my dilute, just hang on to it. I'm gonna go over here on this side. This stuff goes forever. I'm gonna cut five or six teeth with the dilute. There we go. Now, as it goes through here, if it's not clearing that gullet out, I will slightly raise the blade. So let's turn it back on. hear the sound that's, that's pretty much as aggressive as I want to be on it now over here the dilute the ones we hit with dilute are right here and you can see that's clean there's nothing left on there so, now the only thing that we're left looking for 
is to make sure none of these teeth have contacted a nail and knocked the top off of them because if they don't come out sharp we might have to go around again and just uh you know raise the blade up to lower the cut depth to go around again to try to sharpen the tops of those teeth but as far as cutting the gullet i'm happy the last thing i didn't show you you got this little magnet it normally takes 16 teeth when you get it right where you want you'll count one through 16 when it comes out the edge of the machine take this little magnet and you stick it on the other side at that point and then go all the way around and there's a little reader right here when it senses that metal it'll stop the machine all i'm going to do now is take a visual look and make sure we don't have any short teeth I can, I can definitely feel the difference from how sharp it is going in versus how sharp it is coming out. Uh, we hadn't said so. These are these are 10 degree blades. They're not my favorite by far. Matter of fact, I don't even own any anymore. I don't like them. Uh, they're okay for smaller horsepower mills, but for 35s and ups, I don't recommend them for nothing. Uh, now, if you're in an area that you have aspen or cedar, stuff that don't have hard knots in it, they're, they're okay. Uh, around here, our yellow pine, our Virginia pine, white pine, anytime you encounter a knot, it's like that's a little piece of granite. It's harder than oak. If you try to push through there with a 10 degree blade, it's gonna hop over. I mean, it's just, they're not made for cutting hard knots. They cut softwood great but all our softwoods around here have hard knots in them. So I've started out with them and they're all gone. I don't, don't want them, wouldn't buy any more personally. finished. I'm here a little magnet. It's right here currently. As soon as it gets to where that sensor is, the machine will shut off. That lets you know you've been all the way around. But if you listen, you can hear the cut change. That means it's... It, there it went. Double check it. Make sure we got them all. Turn the oil off. One thing I do dislike about this machine, you gotta raise this up every time, and uh, they didn't put a handle on it. Matthew and I put one on it. If you watched our uh, video with the, putting a blower on the back of our edger, that's the handle to come with it. We repurposed it here, so you can raise and lower this head without having to grab the motor or the capacitor. Now, Don't forget to get your magnet off. That's it. That blade is sharp. We'll run it through the center here in a little bit and uh, confirm the set on it. And it's just, sorry. It's just rinse and repeat from here. <laughs> you know, do if one's good, do two. Two's good, do four. You know, just do more, do more, do more. So we'll be back. Uh, I'll try to go over the center a little bit when I get my head in the right place because you need to be a calm you know maybe go do some yoga or a little zen something to calm yourself down before you get on it but okay guys we're over here using the setter uh we skipped through i've already set 14 blades uh they were all 14 exactly the same uh matthew might bring a camera over here where you can see the gauge I told you i like to be somewhere 
around mid 20s. This tooth is at 34 thousandths. That was 31, 33, 28, you know. If we switch to the other side, let's see here, be that one. Uh, 34, 34. 34, this fades a little better than the other ones. Okay, enough of that. Every one of these blades were anywhere from 33, 34, all the way up to 40 thousandths. Uh, 40 is way too much. If they were 30, 32, you could probably get by with it, but it's still too much. So I'm gonna have to take this setter and unset these teeth. Now to do that, We'll put the blade in here, and I'm going to lower, see it's set right at, it's setting just a little high, right? If I was going to set it, right there's where I set it. What I'm going to do, I'm going to keep, I'm going to lower it down until that tooth gets in the jaws. There we go. And I'm going to go around and mash every one of them teeth back. And I'll put me a little gauge stop here, just... Let me know when I've been all the way around. So I'm going to run these teeth all the way around and I'm going to try to close that gap up. I know it's going to pull that gap back to about 20 thousandths. It's about 20, 21 is about the best you can do. Then I'm going to raise it back up and I'll bend it right back out. So let's get it done. This far out, it's got to be done. Okay, there comes my tape. Pull it off. I can watch the teeth as they go through and see when it's no longer bending any. Okay, we've been all the way through with the teeth. Now we're going to raise the teeth back up in the machine to the appropriate spot and it should be deepest part of that gullet level with the block right there. There it is. Now you know we're bending a left to right and a, and a straight so I'm going to center it up. I can see this tooth that way, this tooth that way and to verify it I'm going to advance it again. Okay. Now I know I'm on the right tooth. You have to be careful with this machine. If it, when it comes back, it strokes three teeth. You go forward. If you accidentally stroke two, now you're bending the wrong tooth. You have to really concentrate. Make sure you get three. I'm normally sitting right here with my eyeballs, watching that tooth on the first cutter to make sure you know it's laid this way because that's the way I'm going to bend it. So let's run these around. We'll take this minute and we'll be done with this blade. Okay guys, I, I finished setting that. Uh, I didn't put a, a mark on there because I've done enough of these. 158 inch blade is 60 pulls to go all the way around. So, that being said, this is the first time we've sharpened these blades for this customer. I don't know what happened to them before, but they were set where I would run. Uh, I'm gonna tell him to call me when he runs these and see if he's happier with them being said around 25,000 versus what they were. It should be, it should stay a lot flatter in the cut, it should be a lot more dependable. Uh, I'm gonna double check it here before we put it in the pile. That's 25, 
23, 25. That one's missing. It's been beat up. I have 25. Six, twenty-five, twenty-five. 25. Okay. I'm happy with that. That's, you know, you got to have a little margin error there. One, two, three, and, you know, like I say, one of those teeth, look like he hit something, just knocked the top off of it. So, it's got plenty of teeth. We want to go file it down and take another whole run off of it, just try to chase that one tooth. Now, if it's three or four, you either have to go down and get them all sharp or, you know, throw it away. But it's just that one. Uh, there's a lot going on here, guys. There's a lot to unpack. You can't get it. I can't cover it all in one video. I know this video is getting long already. There's, uh, it's not impossible by no means. If you run a wood visor sawmill, you can sharpen and set your own blades. There's just a learning curve and, uh, let me say this, if you're having your blades resharpened from wood visor, hey, that's good. If you're having them resharpened from somebody like me that does resharpening, I want that sucker to run his own blades. If he's not sawing, how do you know, you know, what they're doing? I, I run my own blades and I can tell you uh, whether I like them or not. And what I did to this blade is what I've done to my blades where I set my blades and they run great. So, just, you know, I wouldn't take mine to a guy sharp blades that didn't saw. That's no said about that. Okay, guys, we appreciate you watching. Uh, if you got any questions, comments, uh, drop them down below. Say hey, boo-boo. Hey. Boo-boo don't get enough camera time. He's, He's normally busy, or the man behind the camera, but uh, he's here every day. Uh, like I say, drop questions, comments. We'll be glad to respond to them. And we appreciate all you watching, guys. We'll see you back at the bill. Thank you for watching. Here's a video selection and a playlist suggestion. Click here to subscribe for more great content. We'll see you at the mill.